Hi, welcome back. Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about something very important to me and very important to the Coast Guard and the Marine Corps. There's only one person who's ever been awarded the Medal of Honor in the Coast Guard. Only one. And his name was Douglas Monroe, and he's awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously for actions that he took on Guadalcanal on May 24th of 1943. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. By 1942, Monroe was serving on the USS Hunter Liggett, the only Coast Guard vessel that took part in the amphibious assault in Guadalcanal as a coxswain for the landing crafts delivering U.S. Marines to the battlefield. Douglas Monroe was born on October 1919 in Vancouver, Canada to James and Edith Monroe. Douglas's father was an American while his mother had immigrated from England at age 15. The family moved to a place called Clay Elum in Washington State when Douglas was two. Despite growing up during the Great Depression, his family fared pretty well due to Douglas's father holding a steady job, which enabled them to maintain a rather comfortable lifestyle. Now, Douglas was keenly aware of the fact that they had it relatively good compared to most people, and this led him to want to help people who are less fortunate than them in various ways. One of the ways that he would help people was he and a friend would go out and chop wood and give it to folks who didn't have the money to afford coal in the wintertime so they could heat their homes. His desire to help others who were less fortunate was probably one of the beginning reasons of his desire to serve the country. So he had a relatively humble upbringing. Mother was from England. Father was from America. Even at a young age, he wanted to help people. Eventually, Douglas started attending Central Washington College of Education where he excelled academically. However, it's likely he had higher aspirations at the time. In mid-1939, there were talks in the United States about the potential for a draft to take place due to the worsening situation in Europe with Germany, so Monroe preemptively enlisted in the Coast Guard on September 18th of that year. Once he enlisted, he met Raymond J. Evans, who became one of his best friends up until his final moments on Earth. Monroe, Evans, and 18 other recruits were sent to Air Station Port Angeles, initially performing menial tasks like doing yard work or food preparation until they were assigned to the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Spencer. Their real training began when they departed for the open ocean, navigating from Washington to Staten Island, New York, to participate in patrols of the Atlantic Ocean, which at the time, the Atlantic Ocean, especially near the eastern seaboard, was being plagued with German U-boats and all kinds of other things like that. There was a lot of stuff going on in the Atlantic at that time because of the war in Europe. Now, I don't know if in 1939 there was already a presence of U-boats or things like that, but they were trying to maintain a security presence out there, especially being that they were protecting the coast, right? Which is what the Coast Guard does. They guard the coast. Now, to give you just an idea of just about how far of a journey it is from L.A. to New York, they had to travel over 5,400 miles, which would be like going to London from New York City and then coming halfway back, except on a boat instead of a plane. Now, when Monroe and Evans were underway, they trained as quartermasters, and they studied how to navigate on the ocean and track their journey while also assisting with daily deck maintenance. They also prepared for the signalman rating, which required them to master Morse code, semaphore signals, and message encoding. They were also required to learn how to use signal flight to pass messages as well. Their hard work and diligent study of their craft earned them the rate of signalman. By the time it was September of 1940, Monroe advanced to signalman third class, which is the same thing as petty officer third class, also referred to as M3, meaning signalman third class, which is an E4 or the fourth enlisted rank for Coast Guardsmen. Now, I don't know how hard it is to get promoted in the Coast Guard. My wife's in the Coast Guard, but I know it's very difficult to get promoted in the Navy because similar to the Coast Guard, they have to take tests to get promoted and then you get promoted based on how well you did in the test. So I don't know if they were doing that at that time specifically, but I know that it's difficult to get promoted. So obviously he was ahead of his game if he got promoted to E4 that quickly after having enlisted one year previous, right? Anyway, in June 1941, he was transferred to the USS Hunter Liggett, where he and Evans trained as coxswains for landing crafts. Despite their initial lack of small boat experience, they excelled in their training and they were assigned to transport Division 17. The US entry into World World War II in December 1941 indicated imminent combat action. After continued training, Monroe was transferred to the USS Macaulay in July of 1942, while Evans remained on the Hunter Liggett, making their first separation as they headed for the Pacific Theater. Now, just to give you guys a, a kind of idea about what kind of landing craft were used out in the Pacific Theater, specifically on Guadalcanal, there was three that I'm aware of. Now, there may be more, and if there are more, let me know in the comments, because I'd like to know. The first one was called Higgins Boats, also known as 
Business Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel, or LCVPs. These boats were designed by Andrew Jackson Higgins of New Orleans in the late 1930s to meet military specifications. The LCVPs were 35 feet long and carry about 36 soldiers. They were transported by destroyers, transports, and cargo ships. The LZVPs were used in both World War II and the Korean War. The next one's called LVT-1, also known as the Amtrak, short for Amphibian Tractor. These motorized vehicles were designed by Donald Roebling in 1940 to transport soldiers and equipment from ships to beaches. The LVT-1s were mainly used for logistical support at Guadalcanal. And then the last one is LCM-2s. These landing craft were used to hoist Marine Corps Stuart Light tanks on the Guadalcanal invasion beaches on August 7th of 1942. So in any case, they went from New York all the way in the Pacific Theater. They managed to get all the way out there to the Solomon Islands where Guadalcanal was located. So the Marines wanted to invade Guadalcanal and conduct defensive actions there because apparently there was intelligence that discovered a Japanese airfield near Lunga Point on Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. And that just will not do. We had to take offensive action and we had to step foot on the island to take control of that airstrip so that way we could prevent the enemy from using it. On August 7th, 1942, Monroe participated in landing Marines on Tulagi in the Solomon Islands. He spent the night on the island communicating with offshore ships and evacuated casualties the following day. Eventually, he was reunited with his friend Evans on Guadalcanal, codenamed Cactus. Monroe worked tirelessly moving supplies, rescuing airmen, and transporting casualties. In late September, Marines faced intense resistance near the Matanikau River. Monroe led Higgins' boats to land and reinforcements, but was ordered to extract the overwhelmed Marines under heavy fire. Ignoring calls to retreat, Monroe provided covering fire, allowing the Marines to evacuate. So this guy was dedicated. He was putting his life on the line, trying to protect Marines, trying to get Marines off the beach, and also trying to get them on the beach. He was all over the place, doing all kinds of different things. I don't think this was something he was prepared for when he was delivering firewood to people when they were cold. That kind of laid the foundation for these types of actions to take place eventually. Now, Monroe and other people were responsible for navigating landing craft full of Marines along the coast of Guadalcanal, which was one of the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. Now, a month into the Guadalcanal campaign, then Lieutenant Colonel Louis B. Chesty Puller, who, by the way, if you don't know who Louis B. Chesty Puller is, you need to do some research because he's one of the most famous Marines to ever have existed and probably one of the most decorated Marines to ever have existed as well. Just to give you an idea of like how famous this guy is, he is the only Marine in the history of the Marine Corps to be awarded five Five separate Navy crosses, which is one step below the Medal of Honor. And this guy had five of them by the end of his career. Hopefully that gives you an idea of just how famous this dude is. In any case, Lieutenant Colonel at the time, Louis Chesty Puller embarked three companies of Marines on the landing craft to take control of the Western region of the island. At the time, Monroe was only 22 years old and he took control of 10 landing craft to move Chesty Puller's men on the Western coast. After successfully landing and moving 500 yards inland, Monroe took one of the landing craft and returned to the staging area. Just one hour after landing on the western coast of the island, Marine forces were overcome by Japanese bombing raids, driving out their gunfire support. The Marines were being driven back to the beach and many did not have radios to request assistance. A single help spelled out in t-shirts on the ridge near the beach sent a loud and clear signal to those that were looking on the beach to try to figure out what was going on. So they didn't have comm, which naturally comm is down, or they just didn't have the radios for it. So they used whatever they could, which they found some t-shirts and they spelled out help. So hopefully they were hoping, God, I really hope the Navy sees this because we're, we need some help right now. Now back at the staging area, Monroe volunteered to navigate the same landing craft to rescue the Marines from enemy fire. Nearing the beach and braving incoming fire, Monroe directed the landing craft to push forward even with Japanese forces gaining ground and nearing the beach. So this guy was going in oncoming heavy enemy fire to rescue the Marines that he had just dropped off only one hour prior because they were getting completely overwhelmed by Japanese forces. So completely disregarding his own safety, what set back out to go rescue these guys. Now, as the Marines re-embarked on the landing craft, Monroe immediately navigated his vessel between enemy fire and the Marine forces, providing much needed cover for the Marines. With his efforts, all the Marines, all of them, every single one of them, including all of the wounded, were safely taken off the island. Monroe later helped free a grounded landing craft that was full of Marines who were not far from enemy forces. At the same time, the Japanese forces began firing machine gun rounds and Monroe was struck with a single bullet. He ended up dying on September 27th of 1942 at the age of 22 before the forces 
is returned to the staging area. So this guy was going back and forth, like putting Marines on the beach, taking them to the beach, and picking them up and rescuing them. Rescuing tons of people, including wounded. That is a hard dude right there. Like completely disregarding his own safety. In my mind, that's courage. That is like unfettered courage. Placing everyone else's life before your own. In a letter dated just five days later, the commanding officer of the unit wrote to inform Monroe's parents of their son's heroism and death. Quote, upon regaining consciousness, his only question was, did they get off? And so he died with a smile on his face and the full knowledge that he had successfully accomplished a dangerous mission, the letter said. Douglas Monroe being the only person in the entire U.S. Coast Guard's history to have been awarded the Medal of Honor has obviously inspired tons of people since then. There's been tons of ceremonies held in recognition of his heroism, and he is still celebrated as a hero today with the Coast Guard and with the Marine Corps, obviously, because he rescued so many of us. Lieutenant Colonel Lewis B. Chesty Puller, one of the men that he had saved, he saved Lieutenant Colonel Lewis B. Chesty Puller. Imagine, if he hadn't been there, there's a good chance that Lieutenant Colonel Colonel Lewis B. Chesty Puller wouldn't have made it to the end of his career, would not have been the most decorated Marine in history. But as a direct result of Douglas Monroe's heroism and bravery, he kept Lieutenant Colonel Lewis B. Chesty Puller alive. In any case, for his sacrifice, Douglas Monroe was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest award, and an award that Chesty Puller himself nominated Monroe for. So after everything that happened, Chesty Puller nominated this guy for the Medal of Honor because he was like, this dude saved my life and saved countless other Marines' lives during that battle. President Franklin D. Roosevelt presented the Medal of Honor to Monroe's parents in May of 1943. Douglas's mother, Edith Monroe, actually enlisted in the Coast Guard despite being a Gold Star mother, and she was also 48 years old at the time. She completed boot camp, earned a commission in the SPARS, which at the time was the women's branch of the Coast Guard, and eventually became a commanding officer of the Coast Guard barracks in Seattle. She served until she was discharged as a lieutenant in 1945. Now, I want to read the citation to you because citations are what actually explain the heroism and the acts that somebody took to be awarded whatever medal they were awarded. It, whether it's like peacetime or combat time, the citation is important. So attention to orders. For extraordinary heroism and conspicuous gallantry in action above and beyond the call of duty as petty officer in charge of a group of 24 Higgins boats engaged in the evacuation of a battalion of Marines trapped by enemy Japanese forces at Point Cruz, Guadalcanal on 27 September 1942. After making preliminary plans Plans for the evacuation of nearly 500 beleaguered Marines. Monroe, under constant strafing by enemy machine guns on the island and at great risk of his life, daringly led five of his small craft towards the shore. As he closed the beach, he signaled the others to land. And then in order to draw the enemy's fire and protect the heavily loaded boats, he valiantly placed his craft with its two small guns as a shield between the beachhead and the Japanese forces. When the perilous task of evacuation was nearly completed, Monroe was instantly killed by enemy fire but his crew, two of whom were wounded, carried on until the last boat had loaded and cleared the beach. By his outstanding leadership, expert planning, and dauntless devotion to duty, he and his courageous comrades undoubtedly saved the lives of many who otherwise would have perished. He gallantly gave his life for his country. And that is the story of Douglas Monroe, the only Coast Guardsman to ever be awarded the Medal of Honor in the history of the nation. I hope that you enjoyed this story. I hope we all learned something today. Let me know what you thought about this video in the comments. Let me know if there's anything that I might have missed or any facts or small factoids that people out there might appreciate about Douglas Monroe. As always, I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.